Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Beth says thank you so much for coming out tonight to listen to this panel discussion on the Irish Enlightenment. So when asked to think of the great Irish writers, it's easy to go straight to the 20th century greats. Beckett, Joyce, Yeats, and the O'Briens, Edna and Flan. This evening we're going to think about a different phase of philosophical and political writing that took place in Ireland, in what was in many ways a prominent position within the Republic of Letters. The turn of the 18th century and surrounding period marked something of a high point for intellectual output from Ireland by a group of thinkers with interesting overlapping stories. Many of these people are amongst the best known historical names associated with the island, and this evening we're going to ask our eminent experts to put their work in the context of a distinctive Irish Enlightenment. In doing so, we'll discuss some of the key figures in this period, Jonathan Swift, Edmund Burke, and George Barclay. So I'll just introduce our panellists. Tom Stoneham is a professor of philosophy at the University of York. Uh, Ian McBride is foster professor of Irish history at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Hartford College. And Catherine O'Donnell is an associate professor of the history of ideas at University College Dublin. Okay, so Ian, I'm going to give you the slightly difficult job of starting off by, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about this period in Irish history? Uh, what kind of a place uh, is Dublin or Ireland at this, at this time? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, that's a big question. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I, I suppose um, to start off with, uh, I'd say that if you were searching for enlightenment in the 18th century, you wouldn't necessarily go to Dublin or Ireland to start off with in, in some ways you might think it's one of the last places to find enlightenment. Um, if by enlightenment you mean you know, intellectual vibrancy, but also cosmopolitanism and all the values of you know, humanity, reason, rational inquiry, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and tolerance. Uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, who was the, the most famous inhabitant of Dublin in the first half of the 18th century, uh, certainly didn't find much enlightenment there. Uh, Swift said that Ireland was a dirty, obscure nook in which you could hope to find nothing except plague, poverty and famine. Um, and that was said in a letter to a friend. Um, and it's, it involves a degree of exaggeration. I'm not saying you should take anything that Swift said at face value, but it's actually pretty consistent. That's what he said to all his friends, and he said it in his public writings as well. And so Swift's view of Ireland was that it was a basket case um, that proved all the rules of Norman human behaviour wrong. Um, so in politics, Ireland looked as if it was a free country because it had its own parliament and it was a kingdom but it was subordinate to London, and its, its rulers, its Protestant rulers, felt colonialised in the early 18th century um, because Westminster, the Westminster Parliament, was intervening in Irish affairs and claimed the right to legislate for the Irish. In economics, more uh, importantly or more um, depressingly, I suppose, um, Swift uh, kept saying that the wealth of a nation lies in the number of its inhabitants, which was the orthodox view and the view he ultimately satirised in a modest proposal. Um, but in Ireland, the population was expanding. It got to about 2.5 million uh, by the 1720s, and it wasn't getting richer. Um, there was some consumer um, uh, trade in Dublin, but the position of the vast majority of the people um, was um, on the subsistence line, really, and this turned out to be very precarious when there were poor famines, as there were in the later 1720s, um, which led to emigration to North America, and then in 1740, really serious famine that led to the demise of about 15% of the population. Um, so in those two ways, and also in religion, um, where the established church uh, spoke to or commanded the, the loyalty of just a tenth of the population and and yet the government didn't seem to give it its full backing. In all of those ways, um, Ireland seemed to be quite unusual and a sort of warped version 
of what at least, what seemed to be the normal reality, at least for English people and the people who came from England. So you could say Ireland was the it was the reverse of enlightenment. It had this toxic mix of religion and politics and violence in its past and to some extent in its present. And that's what the Enlightenment was supposed to be opposed to. That is making it sound a bit like something Joyce would say. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that comparison. So then with Jonathan Swift, often because of uh, the proposal, we find him regarded as quite sympathetic towards uh, you know, the, the people of Ireland. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case, right? He had sort of more complicated views on people as well as the, the city itself. Um. Well, um, I think he was sympathetic uh, to the Irish people. I mean, unusually sympathetic to, in particular, Irish Catholics. Um, but at the same time, he didn't think the Irish could escape responsibility for their own problems. Um, so it's true that he wrote against um, what well, he thought Catholics were feckless and um, had uh, weren't very careful about their um, marriage uh, customs, sort of sexually irregular kind of people. Um, but that wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, by the standards of anti-Catholic invective of Swift's time, that was quite restrained. Um, he hated the Ulster Presbyterians. He hated the English government. He hated the Whig Party. Um, he hated bishops uh, as a sort of institution, though he liked some of the individuals. Um, he hated the landlords, and they were the people who he was really getting at in a modest proposal, which of course argues that the children of Ireland, the babies of Ireland, should be fattened up until the age of one, sent to the slaughterhouse, and then served up, you know, boiled and stewed on the tables of the gentry. I mean, that was designed to um, literalise the exploitation of, of Ireland by its gentry. I believe he also suggested uh, using their skin for upholstery as well. That's yeah, right. There's all, all sorts of you know extra byproducts of the baby trade. So, um, so in view of this, we see a sort of taking off of a sort of period of uh, learning and you know high thought in Ireland. Can you speak a bit to what kind of circumstances might have made it the case that? this becomes a place where people have a lot of interesting things to say? Yes, I, um, w there were always people with interesting things to say and, um, and we shouldn't be seduced by Swift's um, complaints about Ireland. I mean, this is an unusually um, fertile intellectual scene um, because you could find Archbishop King, the Archbishop of Dublin, serious writer on theological and philosophical matters. Um, John Toland, um, the, the deist from Donegal, um, improbable but true, um, who passed through Dublin and scandalised Irish society by, um, well, by defending the core doctrines of Christianity but leaving out practically everything that Christians thought uh, was important about Christianity. Um, Francis Hutchison, the Ulster Presbyterian who taught in Dublin and went on to become a moral professor of moral philosophy in Glasgow, where he taught Adam Smith, had a big impact on David Hume, and a whole generation of Presbyterian clergymen. So there were there were significant people there, but then in the um, they had to communicate with one another, and um, and what Ireland did have, it, I think, it, in terms of the infrastructure of enlightenment was a strong publishing, printing trade, <clears throat> um, libraries, a sleepy university, Trinity College Dublin, I mean not, uh, sort of rather more like Oxford and Cambridge than its innovative um, Scottish uh, parallels at, at the time, not a sleepy university, um, but a, an associational culture, that is, you know, a network of clubs and societies, like the Dublin Philosophical Society, or the Dublin Society, uh, which is founded in 1731, which would all promote enlightened values um, in, you know, in, within the, the world of public opinion. And, and that's important because people in the 18th century thought they lived in an enlightened age, and they didn't just mean an age that produced great geniuses. They meant an age when the values of the geniuses um, percolated into an ordinary sermon or an ordinary pamphlet and were discussed 
in these clubs and societies by, by you know, when I say ordinary by ordinary educated literate people at the time. Okay, and I suppose that would have only been a sort of snapshot of the of the population on that. Sure. Um, so I wondered, Catherine and Tom, whether you'd like to jump in on some of the sort of background features that yeah, I think one of the things, just to kind of complement what, what Ina has been saying, um, when we say the Irish Enlightenment, um, and I've only started to say the Irish Enlightenment in the last number of months, it almost sounds like a joke. So the first kind of couple of sentences that Ian was saying, like, oh, it's a you know filthy, dirty backwater, is stultifying. Why would you want to be in Dublin in the 18th century when you could be anywhere else in the world? You wouldn't pick Dublin. And, I disagree. I think that that's the stereotype, and that was a stereotype that was promoted by the irascible uh, Swift, for one. And also, I think it's a, it's it's um, the fact that we haven't kind of claimed Ireland as having a particular kind of enlightenment. In other words, pretty wonderful philosophy coming out of this uh, country uh, in the 18th century is. I think can be found, a clue can be found in the 18th century Irish society, which is the Society for Academics Working in 18th Century Studies. And it, the subtitle for that is, is uh, Two Traditions. Um, and so there's this belief that there was a, a small colonial um, Protestant elite in Dublin, and that the rest of the country was Catholic, poor, and kept in poverty and, and, and hiding, to quote um, um, Daniel Corkery's famous book, The Hidden Ireland. Whereas actually, if you really look at what was happening, Dublin was one of the most amazing places to be in 18th century Europe. And there weren't two parallel traditions where, but that's a, again a stereotypical story of one dispossessed, impoverished, uh, multitude of poor people who spoke Irish, and then another small group of people who only spoke in English. Actually, there was a huge amount of cross-cultural engagement between people who predominantly came from that Gaelic uh, tradition and uh, the people who spoke English in the colonial garrison town of, of Dublin. And I think it was one of the most vibrant places to be in, in the 18th century. Um, it had the, the libraries, it had the university, it had Smock Valley <coughs> Theatre which was the first royal theatre to uh, be granted a, a charter um, under the Jacobite King of King Charles I, the first, um, in, uh, first royal theatre outside London. A very, very vibrant place um, that had five hours of entertainment most nights. Uh, it had, again by the 1720s, there was about 24 coffee houses within a quarter of a mile area of, of um, Dublin Castle. It was a place of great Gaelic scribal activity, um, wonderful Irish music, so Handel, who of course famously spent time in Dublin and uh, dedicated his Messiah, which some of you may have heard of, to the people of Dublin. It had its first um, performance in Fishamble Street, just uh, a stone's throw from that Smock Alley Theatre. Um, and he enjoyed his time in Dublin by um, hanging out with a guy called Mr. Hill, who had a music shop in Cork Hill, and got to hear a lot of uh, traditional Irish music. So the scribal and Gaelic activity, I think, has been something that we haven't paid proper attention to. Um, the, the amount of translation of uh, European philosophical work that was taking place was also quite remarkable. And it not only had a great publishing um, uh, culture, it had a great piracy publishing culture, and so it, um, it freely um, printed and reprinted books uh, that were under license uh, here in England and sent them on to the, the next parish, which was the, the colony of, of Boston. So the links between uh, particularly Scots-Irish um, Ireland and America is another way in which we can see the island of Ireland being very kind of a vibrant and well-connected, uh, outward-looking place at the time. And then the other way in which Ireland was very connected, um, uh, culturally speaking, was I think through the, the Irish overseas, the emigres, the wild geese, who because of the penal laws that um, oppressed uh, Catholics um, and dissenters, but those, those wild geese left, uh, particularly Munster, they left Ireland and went to France and set up all kinds of businesses, cognac houses, banks, um, and became part of the intelligentsia uh, 
in, in France, uh, in Spain, in Italy, and again circulated that news back to their families back in Ireland. Um, so Edmund Burke, who uh, anybody who knows me knows that Edmund Burke's my boyfriend. Edmund Burke, um, he came from, from that kind of dispossessed Gaelic elite background. Uh, he's somebody, I think, who's best understood as combining a, a hybridity of cultures. So obviously, he, he spoke and wrote in, in English um, some of the most curious, anomalous speeches of the British canon of the 18th century, or Edmund Burke's speeches. But they make really good sense when you put them next to the Irish political poetry, of particularly the Munster area in which he was uh, uh, raised um, until a teenager. Um, so that political poetry, I think, very much fueled his outlook and very much fueled his politics, his political theory, and his aesthetics. Um, so in some ways, I think one of the hallmarks of, of 18th century thought uh, in Ireland is this presence, whether it's um, readily acknowledged or not, of um, poetry, uh, performance, and the politics of the not quite vanquished uh, Gaelic Ireland. So that's that's part of the scene that I would see that makes um, Dublin and Ireland at this time a, a very interesting place and a, and a fusion of different kinds of cultures that we mightn't on first glance um, see to be readily apparent, but, but it's there. That's interesting. So, you know, a place that is not defined by various kinds of division and kind of crossovers, but one that can be well understood through thinking about, you know, instances of separation and instances of, of overlap. Uh, Tom, I'm just wondering about the kind of educational climate. I mean, so you spend a lot of time thinking about Barclay. Is there anything that we should know about Dublin as a place that people studied, maybe, specifically Trinity? Or? Well, so it's, it's interesting, <coughs> sorry, uh, Ian mentioning uh, Dublin Philosophical Society. And I was thinking about the infrastructure of Enlightenment as you were talking about that, because that was founded in uh, 1682. and um, it's quite striking that the early members were all went on to be provosts of Trinity, and as with the exception of William Molyneux, um, who was independently wealthy. And you see in this pattern in the early stages a very, very close tie between these intellectual structures that are being built and the existing establishment. So, uh, again, the f early members of the Dublin Philosophical Society, two went on to be Archbishops of Dublin, um, William King and um, uh, Narcissus Marsh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's this, in, certainly in the early part of the period, it's very much the establishment which is beginning to set up the infrastructure, but not moving away from the establishment. And that seems to me to contrast a little to what was happening in London where an awful lot of the engagement in intellectual life was from people who were outside the establishment of the church and the universities. Is that mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so one thing, uh, just picking up on what both of you have said, um, I suppose the, the fusion of ideas that was going on in Dublin, um, it's important, I think, to know that this was, in a way, not supposed to be happening. <laughs> and yeah. it was going on under the surface of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, some great um, historical work recently on pubs and taverns and the sort of promiscuous uh, social world that existed in, in Irish taverns. I mean, strictly Shocking. speaking, <laughs> um, the, the Protestants, the Anglicans, the Catholics, and the dissenters um, were, I, I mean, in legal terms, supposed to be leaving rather separate worlds. Um, so uh, I mean, Presbyterians were excluded from political power by the sacramental test, uh, an oath that they had to take. They had to take communion according to the rights of the Church of Ireland in order to qualify for any public office at national or, or private level. But they were also excluded from Trinity College Dublin until 1793. So the, the first, the University of Ulster was Glasgow in the 18th century and between a third and, and um, half of the students at Glasgow were um, Ulster Presbyterians who described themselves as Scoto Hibern, Scots Irish, um, in Glasgow. Um, so there is a, a world which isn't, it's not separate from the rest of Ireland. And in, in the figure of Francis Hutchison, who taught a dissenting academy in Dublin 
Um, it's, it's interacting with mostly Protestant Ireland, but it's, um, its focal point is outside. Um, the ta- I mean, ultimately, Hutchison leaves and goes for a better job in Glasgow. The, um, in Dublin, uh, the Anglicans, the, the Protestant elite, I think, um, are constantly looking towards London, and you know, London sucks in talent. Uh, from Dublin, not just the Protestants, but you know the obvious figures, including Swift and Burke, and the Catholics. Meanwhile, um, have their seminaries in Paris, um, it's the largest one, but also in Louvain and Rome, and and that world, the sort of displaced Catholic intelligentsia, uh, does have a very particular set of problems that it's interested in, which I think is not obviously related to the Enlightenment at all. I mean, it's, it involves a sort of scholastic learning that the Enlightenment's usually quite scathing of. Um, and I suppose the, um, the point about the relationship between establishment <coughs> and Enlightenment is, is true, um, but uh, uh, makes me want to add that the, what you get among the Presbyterians in 18th century Ireland is a rather more radical form of Enlightenment thought, at least insofar as you can say rational religion, um, the right of private judgment, opposition to creeds and confessions, the imposition of creeds on, on churches, on, on believers, with all of which was very central to Irish Presbyterians. That, I mean, that's a more radical strand of thought that appeals to the Enlightenment, I think, um, and ends up ultimately with um, the United Irishmen. Um, in the 1790s, and the idea of a, a non-sectarian Irish nation, so that um, there, there are conservative and more radical strands there. But the conservative strands are pretty strong, I think. Is the, the interesting? So you mentioned Toland earlier. So Dublin is the only place that Christianity, not mysterious, was burned, and that was the provost again who awarded that to George Brown. So there's a strong sense of trying to control this emerging enlightenment from, from the uh, Anglican and educational establishment. Why do you think that was then? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what ex- if Ireland is more conservative than England or Scotland, perhaps, in its enlightenment philosophy? Well, I, one thing that I feel comes out in the period is this sense of moral panic um, that somehow they're sitting on uh, an unstable social structure mm-hmm. and that this must be the, 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 the strong the strength of the top-down structure must must be maintained otherwise Ireland will become as, as you know, Swift satirizes it mm. um, so, so Barclay, for example, has a very low opinion of the uh, native Irish. Um, he, uh, he thinks that they're, as so we'd say genetically, they're, they're uh, disposed to sloth and dirtiness. Um, and that this is, this is actually inhibiting the, the society from developing, the economy from developing. There's a lovely bit when he's writing to the Catholic church, clergy. He says, you can, you can feed and clothe your, your, uh, your congregation with just the breath of your words by preaching that sloth is a sin. And it's this fear that there's this large population who are not contributing to the social order. Mm-hmm. And, and <coughs> their church isn't helping either. The sort of... Uh, tension between institutional control and then the kind of casual organisation of things in Ireland. I'm just wondering, to kind of return to the to the lower end of things with the, the pubs, I was wondering about the role of the coffee houses in this. I know, Catherine, that's something you've uh, said as a kind of a key feature of the way people organised and, uh, and, and spoke. And, and yeah, well, the coffee houses were all around Dublin Castle, um, but they, I suppose most importantly, they were near Smock Alley Theatre and near Essex. Um, Key, which is where the, the boats at the time um, came up and was, that was where the custom house was. And all of these boats um, 
traded. It was kind of Dublin was the main port for for most of the country, except perhaps for Kinsale and Cork and a little bit of Waterford. And they would mainly have traded with France. But um, <coughs> news news of the entire world came in at that particular quay, and it would have been unloaded. The newsprint would have been unloaded into the coffee houses. So it's where you went to hear the news, discuss the news, and if you were a young Edmund Burke just graduated from Trinity, you published your own newspapers um, and you circulated them and you found out what people thought of them. It's where we have what, what uh, historians would call at the time the, the, the public sphere and, and a much more um, mixed public sphere than we might ordinarily have been led to believe existed in a country that had such strong silos and laws against the three main groups of Catholics and, and uh, dissenting Protestants and Anglicans um, mingling together, you could actually find them in coffee houses. Okay, that's interesting. So at this point, I might see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah, well, it's uh, early days yet in the <coughs> Q&A, but um, so I'd like to throw two or three of them out at you at once. Um, <laughs> several names you haven't mentioned yet that uh, I'd like to uh, hear about. By the way, I'm, I'm originally from Louisiana, which has somewhat similar of the uh, uh, tendencies of, of, of what you're talking about in Ireland uh, in, in the old days. Um, the, the questions, I, the, the things I'd like to mention are, first of all, no one has mentioned yet George Barclay. We can hear some, a little more about uh, his contribution. Uh, but, by the way, I would say that uh, we had a uh, professor uh, years ago at uh, Tulane University, my original undergraduate university, uh, who was an unreconstructed European history professor who uh, didn't like Britain very much and liked Ireland even less. So, you know, <laughs> so, 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 so uh, George Barclay. Um, Wolf Tone has not been mentioned, and of course that was a, 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 a signal of that in, in, in a number of ways, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, so, so I guess those are the two that I really like to have discussed a little more. Okay. Their contribution and, and, and their role in the Irish Enlightenment. Thank you. Thanks. We'll just take one more question from this woman behind you, so if you just pass the mic back there. And we won't let you down on the on the George Barclay front, don't worry. Um, just a very quick question. Smock Alley Theatre, what was happening there? What were the performances that were happening, you know, during during this time? Great question, thanks. So we start with the Smock Alley and the performances and then we can... So oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Renegade. Publishing industry, you, you mentioned the activity of piracy, you mentioned the activity of translation, you suggested that, that the Irish culture is a scribal one. What is the, is it possible through looking at, 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 at the publishing industry in, in Dublin time to see what is specifically um, um, Irish in terms of ideas which is not appealing as well? Brilliant, thanks. Um, yes. So we've got three that match speakers pretty nicely here, so maybe if you could start with Catherine on Smock Alley, what, what were they actually putting on for the five hours at a time? Well, one of the big, so, what, what you would have for your five hours, you'd have you know, circus performers and acrobats, and you'd have um, long um, declamations of poetry, you'd have various one-act plays, you'd um, have lots of Shakespeare, but, like different scenes of Shakespeare. Um, a big complaint of the young ed teenage Edmund Burke and his friends was the fact that Thomas Sheridan, who was the father of uh, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, um, kept putting on plays from that country that despises us, in other words, England. And uh, they had uh, quite a few um, riots uh, at the time as well, and set up their own um, indigenous native um, uh, theatre down in Capel Street, which was going to just put on plays, mainly written in English, by Irish-born people. So in the 1740s, you do see this movement to put on uh, um, uh, plays written in Ireland. But again, as, as Ian has said, you know, London took a great amount of, of theatrical talent, especially the writing talent, um, from Dublin. Um, it's hard not to look at 18th century uh, British theatre and not actually think that it's mainly Irish people there, um, such as Farker, for example, being one of the, the main ones, um, Goldsmith later in the 18th century. Um, so that was kind of what, what Smock Alley was about. And then the, what kind of ideas were being produced in, in Ireland? 
Um, I think that was the last question, and I for, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let um, the others answer the, the first gentleman. Um, well, I think we could give you a list like Toland, uh, Molyneux, Hutchinson, uh, Barclay, um, the uh, the men of Trinity College like Peter Brown, uh, Thomas Leland, Archbishop King, um, Narcissus Marsh. Uh, this is just to give you know, a flavour of some of the people who wrote just in philosophy. Um, <coughs> and that only takes you up to, and Swift of course, who I think you can also see with some philosophical tracks in uh, most notably Tale of the Tub. That just takes you from the, the, the 1680s, 1690s up until the 1740s. That's not even to mention um, all of the people we had um, uh, in subsequent decades. So quite a lot of, of uh, intellectual ferment that we don't actually yet talk about as a school. We don't actually yet, you know, talk about as, as a kind of coherent body of ideas that would be in disagreement with each other in some points, but actually begin, I think, if you look at them, begin to have certain, if you like, family traits. Okay. Ian, should I say a bit more about the sort of publishing culture and the... Yeah, um, well, the, I, I could talk about that. The other thing um, I wanted to pick up on was Wolf Tone. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, Catherine said earlier that the Irish Enlightenment is still an, it's a new idea. It's quite uncertain of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did a little Google search on it. Um, references to the Irish Enlightenment are almost all come from the last 10 years. And there's a lot of um, scare quotes and question marks um, floating around. You know, it really hasn't got a lot of uh, self-confidence. Mm -hmm. The one area where the Enlightenment used to be, I mean, it was quite early on bandied about by Irish historians in a rather vague way that my philosophical um, companions here would find, you know, lacking precision, was with reference to Wolf Tone and the United Irishmen. And it, it's been a very long-standing idea that Irish republicanism at the end of the 18th century was enlightened as opposed to romantic. Mm -hmm. And it was important for a whole lot of reasons uh, to distinguish the United Irish men from later kinds of Irish republicanism. And one of the reasons that was important was that Irish republicanism was expressing itself in violence at the end of the 20th century in Ireland itself and sometimes here too. And so a generation of historians wanted to recover a different kind of republicanism, which was non-sectarian, was the key thing. And um, now the big question whether later Irish republicans were somehow sectarian, therefore, that was the general premise. And so um, there was a um, a desire to get back to Wolf Tone and, and the Belfast Presbyterians who Wolf Tone described as enlightened, sincere and enlightened Republican and Republicans and try to understand um, what the idea of an Irish Republic had been before the 19th century, before the, the idea of revivalism uh, took place. So <clears throat> the idea then was um, a sort of classical Republican creed that looked back to the, the republics of ancient Rome and Greece took inspiration from America and France and was all about um, the rights of the citizen and not about the nation as a, as a sort of you know, mystic, organic uh, kind of entity. Now, the, the trouble with that, I think, is that um, in the 1790s, um, everywhere in Europe explodes. Mm -hmm. And it's just impossible to say that the Enlightenment caused the explosion. Um, the Enlightenment fed into the French Revolution and its offshoots um, elsewhere, but it was just one ingredient. And in some ways, the sort of so Tom Paine um, would be a, a more you know plebeian, popular uh, ingredient in Irish republicanism, one which a lot of Enlightenment. Uh, writers would have found very disturbing because uh, the Enlightenment thrived in a world which was often quite rarefied and you know, removed from popular disorder, um, not least because popular disorder was associated with the unenlightened quite a lot with the Gordon rioters, for example. So with Wolftown then, would you see much engagement back to the earlier sort of 18th century thought or is this a more sort of 
separate kind of new movement in that direction? Um, uh, well, uh, Wolf Tone, uh, you can tell what Wolf Tone read because um, we have his memoirs and his letters and he read very widely, so he, he read Swift and he uh, claimed that he got from Swift the idea that you had to separate Ireland from England, that England was the origin of all Ireland's problems. Um, he read Rousseau, um, but more the novels than the, the strictly philosophical works um, that are on the, you know, the philosophy um, syllabi. Um, and so I think it, it's hard to to pull out the Enlightenment as a really driving force there. What you can say, I think, is the Enlightenment shaped um, the desire of Republicans to get away from sectarian identities at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and now maybe we'll take a bit of time on George Barclay. So, um, George Barclay is Ireland's, well, often regarded as Ireland's most famous ever philosopher. So how, you know, what should we know about him? How long have you got? Yeah, plenty <laughs> of <your> time. <laughs> so, I mean, it might be good to start with this comment about, thought about, is there a distinctively Irish philosophy developing? And this is something that Barclay was actually thinking about as early as 1708. Mm -hmm. So in his early notebooks, he starts referring to we Irish will, accept, will not accept certain views that are seen as being too abstract or theoretical. So there's this sense he's, he's identifying as a very young man uh, at that, 23 at that age, and then just uh, about to start his fellowship. But um, there's something distinctive. By, at that point, he's probably thinking of the Anglo-Irish, but the, the, uh, the elite, uh, the Protestant elite. But um, something distinctive about seeing things as they really are not being bamboozled by fine words and complicated uh, ideas and just taking things at face value. Um, so from that, of course, a lot of his own philosophy develops. Um, so I think, yes, that's what he's toying with as, a, as an Irish philosophy, is that uh, what we later come to call a philosophy of common sense. Um, but if you're to understand Barclay's thought, um, you have to understand that uh, he's, a, he's a man with a mission, quite literally. Um, all his philosophy is directed to a, to, a, to a single purpose, which is to defeat the sorts of thought that he thinks are going to undermine Christianity, or specifically Anglicanism, and the social order. So his early works that we, we think of as his heroic period, the new theory of vision, principles of human knowledge, the three dialogues, here there's a big emphasis on defeating skeptics and, and both the principles and the three dialogues um, on the title page it says they're, they're, they're written against atheists and skeptics. And so He's starting with those works on the psychology of vision, on perception, and then on the metaphysics of the objects of perception, with a view that somehow this philosophy is going to be foundational in defeating atheism, which obviously he's going to see as a bad thing, and scepticism as well. And scepticism is a bad thing for a slightly different reason. Um, public displays of scepticism, the exercise of sceptical argument in public, the, the uh, questioning and uh, received views, custom and tradition, as he puts it, um, it seemed to, to undermine the social order because those people who are not well enough educated to see the mistakes of the sceptics are going to be influenced by this and place less trust in the uh, intellectual authorities. So he starts with this, this big project that um, he's, going to, he's going to sort out the social problems through philosophy. So we know the motivations a bit then, so this is a terribly unfair thing to ask someone who's been lecturing on Barclay for a long time, but can you give us a flavour of the, the main ideas of his yeah. distinctive metaphysics or his, his distinctive philosophy? 
Well, I think, I think the really fascinating starting point is, is the first book, um, The New Theory of Vision. And here, his, the book is officially about the following problem. If you, well, I, I've got a bit of an advantage over you, but if you, if you look at an object over here, um, and you think it looks a certain distance away from you, but that distance, if we were to kind of represent that in your visual experience, would be, as he puts it, borrowing from Molyneux, a line turned endwise to the eye. The distance is like looking down a line. But then there's no visual information, because the end of a line is just a point, and however long it is, it's not going to look different. So this is a problem. How do we see distance? And Barclay's solution is that we learn to see distance by correlating our visual experiences with what he regards as touch. So ordinary touch, but also kinesthetic experiences and interoceptive experiences of your body. So what, what actually happens is when you look at the screen here and it looks a certain distance, according to Barclay, it looks a certain way which you've learned to associate with walking a certain number of steps. So that's his solution to the problem of depth perception in a very brief outline. How does this fit into the big project? Well, this is, this is where he's, he's clever. Uh, he's, he's always got his eye on, 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 the, on the larger goal. So he says, well, why is it so, why does it work so well? Why, if there's no information about distance in your visual experience, if it's a correlation with touch, how come we can, just by looking, get this information about distance so effectively? It seems miraculous. He actually has a little passage in a later work when he's summarising the view, where he says, imagine someone who could see on an island of blind people, and they're wa you're walking along the blind person and the sighted person are walking along the road and the sighted person says, in five minutes we'll, come to, we'll meet a man with two cows. And that would seem like prophecy to people who are always blind. So clearly vision gives us a massive amount of information about distance, but only through this acquired connection uh, that we learn between how things look and how we're going to experience them when, when we uh, move about in the world. Why does it work like that? Well, his answer is, this must be a language. Vision is a language which we have to learn to inform us, and languages need speakers. He calls it the language of nature in 1709, but in later editions he changes that to the language of the author of nature to make it absolutely clear what the message is. God tells us how far things away are away by giving us visual words which we have to learn the meaning of. So that's a kind of clear origin, original move, um, but it's part of the bigger project. Okay, so this is sort of has a very active role for God almost, doesn't that? As Absolutely. Sort of telling you what to expect uh, in presenting certain kinds of information to you in vision, yeah. uh, you know, it'll inform you that a, a ball is being thrown at you by causing your visual field to change. So this is used then to block various kinds of scepticism, right? Because it, it takes out the idea that this is all happening without God. Yeah, so I mean, in two ways it blocks scepticism. One, um, this story about how you see distance doesn't require there to be a material world there causing those visual experiences. God causes those visual experiences for you. Um, and so we cut out this uh, material world standing between us and God. And his favourite, Barclay's favourite uh, biblical passage is, is from uh, Acts. Uh, in, in God we live and move and have our being. See, that's how he's thinking of it. So, but it, so one, it brings a very direct active role for God. God's continually telling you, watch out, there's a ball coming at your head, um, and useful things like that. Um, on the other hand, it's, it cuts out the scepticism because there's nothing more to know. Once you've learned this language, there's no secrets, there's no hidden nature 
it's just all there on the surface. So this idea about hidden nature, do you think there's this something coming from the science of the period? So you have, you know, a revolution of sorts yeah. that's just taking place in science. Uh, there's new information <coughs> coming towards people uh, that might lead you to believe that what we take to be ordinary objects like this white table aren't really white. And in some sort of sense, if you take a microscope to them, not really table-ish at all. So do you think that plays a role in what, what Barkey's doing at this point? Well, he certainly sees that as, as um, a misunderstanding. He sees that there's a big misunderstanding of the scientific discoveries at this period. So he's thinking, well, um, you say the table's not really white. What you mean is you have some other source of information apart from the visual, and you're prioritising that. And you're saying that's how things really are. But, but why do you think that's how things really are? Surely, again, going back to we Irish, it is white. There's no questioning that. Um, and so that's just how it seems to you. There's nothing more to be said about how the table is coloured, um, whether it's tableish, whether it's round, all, all of its perceptible properties. There's nothing more to be said. And what's happened, he thinks, is that we've taken this other information we've got, perhaps from microscopes. Microscopes are an interesting example at the time. And misunderstood what it's telling us. So his view about microscopes is very simple. When you look at a microscope, you don't see the true nature of something. You're looking, as it were, at a different world. God's giving you a different set of information, which might be useful in different ways. So it's more information, but it's not replacing what you had in your everyday experience. What it's doing is giving you additional information which might allow you to interpret that everyday experience better. So with Barclay then we end up with a sort of a, a world that is very much the same as it was before we read Barclay but we have to understand objects uh, and the ordinary stuff of our surroundings a little bit differently maybe? Yeah, so a lot of people the very common criticism of Barclay is what happens to things when no one's looking at them. So Barclay seems actually completely uninterested in this problem. He, he mentions it a few times and he says, well, I could say this, I could say this, you know, because who cares about things that no one is perceiving? Real ordinary people don't care about things, what thing, what's going on when no one at all is perceiving them. And Barclay's very expansive about what he counts as perceivers. All of the animal kingdom, plus all going the other way up to the angels, there's lots of perceivers about. But if there really is something that's completely unperceived, well, it makes no difference to anyone. So we can just shrug and say, what's the problem? So the, I feel it's an interesting part of the history of Barclay is that he understands himself in this very common sense way as a kind of a man of the people, as a person who's just describing what every ordinary person thinks, and yet it's not exactly how he's been received in the history of philosophy, is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, maybe that's more obvious to people who are coming to Barclay for the first time this evening. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the kind of misunderstanding of Barclay then, or the, the, the way in which he's been interpreted as a thinker? Well, he's, he's, he's interpreted as, as saying that the perceived world isn't a real world. So Swift is a, an example, one of Swift's uh, jokes he knew Barclay quite well, was to instruct his servants not to open the door if Barclay arrived at his house because he could walk straight through it. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a misunderstanding. And we could do a little bit of technical philosophy here if you wanted. Sure. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's two different notions of real in philosophy that Barclay mm -hmm. needs to pull apart and that other people aren't pulling apart. So there's one notion or concept of the real world, which is that it's external to me. It's outside me. It's not part of me. So you contrast what's in my mind, what I'm thinking, my thoughts, and then what's out there. And then there's another notion of the external world, is that it's not merely external, but it's somehow independent. It would be there anyway. And so what Barclay's saying about uh, the ordinary world of, of objects that we experience, is they wouldn't be there anyway. They're there, but only insofar as we experience them. The completely unperceived tree, who cares? It wouldn't be there anyway if it was completely unperceived.
But that doesn't mean that the things we experience aren't external to us in an interesting sense. They don't come from us. When you open your eyes in the morning, what you see is not your choice. It is not in your control in any sense. It comes from outside you. And it's, it stands up in your experiences. It feels like it's external to you. So you experience it as an object. You're the experience, uh, and that's the object in the world. It's just, it doesn't have this, it would be there anyway quality, but he doesn't care about that. So what he's saying is, I believe in a real world, a world that's independent of me, but I don't believe in a world that's independent of everything. Okay, so now that we've introduced this technical philosophy, maybe it's time to see if anyone has any questions again. Do you think that the, that the pragmatics of Berkeley is in fact a hallmark of other Irish philosophers? It seems to me it's definitely a hallmark of Hutchinson. Yes. It's definitely a hallmark of, of Burke. Yeah, but probably not Peter Brown, mm -hmm. um, who seems to be going the other way. Um, but I think, but that's why, I mean, perhaps it's the people Berkeley got into fights with, it, it was over, over this sort of issue, mm -hmm. I think. He did get into arguments with Peter Brown and William King. So. Mm -hmm. Many others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have this question? Um, I don't know if you say, maybe on that sort of question, you can say a bit more about the dynamics between these, because you talked about quite a few of these guys, you know, Burke, uh, Burke Barclay, Tolan, Molyneux, Swift, an independent, in independence to each other, but do they all know each other? Um, it seems like there's a kind of problem of, of like, actually identifying a movement, but if there is a movement, was there a, kind of, was there a leader? Uh, how did they? How did they influence each other? Oh, we got another one on the way back as well. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Yes, um, the front line mentioned two concepts in terms of any century in Europe in terms of explosions or some French Revolution, and popular disorder. In terms of Ireland, would you consider the current chaos within Brexit up? Um, as unfinished business in terms of the Irish unity. Uh, would you like to say a little bit more about the chaos, just to uh, just to focus the question a bit? Yeah, you mentioned the, the topic of popular disorder okay. and sectarian identity. And I just wondered whether this, this is an unfinished business post uh, <coughs> French and uh, current revolutions during the period, and whether Ireland has missed out on that idea of completing the unity of the republic. Okay, so two questions here. Uh, one on the sort of interrelations between the various thinkers, uh, you know, giving somebody a very difficult job of trying to <laughs> carve a way through all of the various people involved. And then a second one on resonances of uh, various chaotic elements of the politics then in more contemporary Irish politics. So I'll let you guys decide where to start based on maybe who wants to speak next. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I suppose we could say that the 17th century has lasted a long time on the island of Ireland. Uh, that would be one reading of, of Irish history. Um, certainly there is a sense that there's an unfinished republic in Ireland, um, but I would suggest that that's not so much about the, you know, the, the partition of the island. There's a sense, speaking as somebody who lives in the Irish Republic, that we actually haven't achieved a republic in the 26 counties. Um, that it's, it's not as egalitarian as it should be and it possibly could be. Um, so that that horizon of the Republican st still remains to be, to be fulfilled. And then in terms of, as, as, as Ian was saying, so that's my answer to that. I think it's a, a fudge, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> um, so in answer to, to uh, the question, was there a movement? Was there a leader? How much did these people interact with each other? Uh, as Ina's pointed out, we've heard about the Scottish Enlightenment for about at least 200 years now. We know that there's a French Enlightenment, we know that there's a European Enlightenment, an American <coughs> Enlightenment. So the idea of talking about an Irish Enlightenment is still very much new. Um, I do think that there were certain kind of family kind of contours. I do think that, that there was things that Irish philosophers debated with each other about. One of them being that you don't necessarily see in other philosophical schools. One of them being, I think, a real fault line and flashpoint in Irish philosophy was, how useful is this? Now, n not a lot of philosophers in other places were actually asking this question, but in Ireland, that's what they fought over. 
So my main man, uh, Edmund Burke, for example, is on the side of Hutchison and Barclay. He's a pragmatist. He hates theory, and he always gave it this kind of disdainful capital T in his letters, theory for the sake of theory. So he's men, not measures. Uh, so the, the, the value of their philosophical thinking for a lot of Irish philosophers was how pragmatically useful is this going to be? So in other words, it is philosophical if it is um, the meaning of their proposition, of their, of their um, philosophical propositions, will be proved by the practical consequences of accepting it. So in some ways, these people who, like Hutchison and, and Barclay and Burke, who claimed they were writing practical philosophy, they were also writing, if you like, scripts that were supposed to intervene in particular political debates at the time that was going to, if everybody got on board with their vision, was going to lead to uh, um, a sense of more liberation for all, a sense of peace and stability, um, a sense of greater um, egalitarianism, even if you're accepting a traditional society, that the, in, in accepting a traditional society was a way if you assented to it, well then the payoff was that you would have um, a, a greater uh, share in the resources and the riches of the, of the society and, and uh, community. Um, so I do think that that is a particular fault line that you see in Ireland, you don't necessarily see in other places. Could you just give us a quick sketch of some of the main uh, debates Burke involved himself in, just because it might be nice to, to think about comparisons between Barclay and Burke later. Just, but Burke turned his back on philosophy quite early to, to enter into politics uh, in his 30s. So he was the ultimate, if you like, practical philosopher in becoming a politician. Uh, and uh, in politics, he loved to take the uh, opposing stance on absolutely everything. So, for example, he spent most of his, uh, the, the kind of what he wanted to be, and he ironically called it his acts and his monuments, which was a dig at, at a, um, kind of a, a rather scurrilous piece of Protestant propaganda in the 17th century. His acts and monument was going to be his campaign against the man who'd won India for the British, Warren Hastings. So that's what he dedicated a huge amount of his political energy to. So that just gives a measure of uh, how much he relished being an oppositional force. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to the, the question about what, how far these people knew each other and were part of a, a common movement. Is that okay? Perfect. Um, and um, one way of thinking about that involves Whigs and Tories um, and the, the problem of party, which was very, very ferocious in the early 18th century. And I hesitate to inflict this on the audience, except that if you've seen um, Olivia Coleman in, in The Favourite, um, you might have picked up a bit of the Wigan Tory uh, feel. So it's a bit more current than, than it normally is. Um, so uh, uh, Archbishop King was a, a moderate Whig, and um, Jonathan Swift was a Tory. What's the quickest way to understand the difference here between the um, Whigs and Tories? Well, they had different views on foreign policy. Um, they had different views on the 17th century in England, the conflict between the monarchy and parliament, and they had different views on religion. One of the quickest ways to tell a Tory and a Whig apart is that they both disliked Catholics and they both disliked dissenters, Protestant nonconformists. But a Tory disliked the Protestant nonconformists more and a Whig disliked Catholics more. And that's how it worked in Ireland. Um, so King, it worked in Ireland, not necessarily in Not necessarily in. Yeah. So King was a, a moderate Whig, um, fell out with Swift. I mean, it took them quite a long time to recover from Queen Anne's reign because Swift was in London, was the, the mouthpiece of the Tory government. Barclay took a Tory view in his sermons on passive obedience, which was a Tory doctrine. Um, which meant that if, if the monarch or the parliament told you to do something that was against God's will, you didn't do it. Um, but then you went to prison or you paid the fine without complaining. That's what the principle of passive obedience was. And that kept Barclay out of Episcopal office <laughs> for a while. So these are sort of rather poisonous um, elements, you know, um, faction between people that could break up groups. Hutchison was a, a really old-fashioned militant Whig who um, took the opposite view 
from Barclay, which was the right of resistance, was a great thing. It was something to be celebrated. It didn't cause disorder. What caused disorder was people telling you you shouldn't resist, because that inevitably led to tyranny, and tyranny would lead to anarchy eventually. When um, you, at a later stage, Burke arrives on the scene, everyone is awake, and um, almost everyone is awake by that stage. The Tories have sort of faded away. But the interesting thing about Burke is that in England, as well as Ireland, to be a Whig always has a, a, an undercurrent of anti-Catholicism about it. You know, freedom in the state uh, went along with freedom in religion, in the church, and the enemy of freedom was the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and Burke is very, very distinctive in his writings in England in dissociating himself from that view and in taking a, a sympathetic view of the Catholic Church. Is this thread, I mean, do you see it in Barclay's writings very actively, this kind of aspect of the you know, duality between these people? Well, so the, the interesting thing is Barclay's clearly a high church Tory in most of his views, but he's a Whig on foreign policy and on trade, which is uh, an interesting combination, which I think isn't that unusual in the Irish Tories. Mm -hmm. And it's been suggested partly the experience of effectively living as a colony has given a different perspective on the Tory foreign policy. And I mean, see, see if a very concrete, I mean, Barclay did write about foreign policy as well, but when he went to, to America to found a college, that was also what he wanted eventually was an episcopacy in America. He wanted there to be a bishop for the colonies in America rather than falling under the Bishop of London, because he thought that that spreading out rather than colonising and cent central control was the effective way to, to develop societies and economies. And so it's that mix of Toryism and then Whiggish foreign policy, which is quite distinctive, I think. So one of the kind of, uh, the last things I really wanted to know about from each of you uh, is you know, why we should be reading these people in this sort of modern age. So what, you know, what are the figures that we've been thinking about so far have to say to us? Uh, one of the most interesting things about this period is the quality of the writing and all of the main people we've mentioned so far loved arguing with people in the press, uh, loved writing sort of pointed and humorous letters uh, with all sorts of different political <coughs> motives and um, maybe could I take you each in, in turn just for a few minutes to talk a bit about why you know why the writing in this period is so interesting and how people used uh, used writing. Um, I think again another kind of family resemblance is that the Irish philosophers were less frightened of eloquence and less frightened of literary styles in fact rejoiced in playing literary games um, and um, we're not as afraid of um, really trying to communicate with, with a, a wide audience, with an imagined wide audience than you see other schools of philosophy doing. So they really felt that, that their writings mattered and that they wanted to communicate. So you, you get a kind of a verve, you get wonderful satire, you get um, in the letters of Burke, you get like loads of passion, loads of great metaphors, loads of grandstanding that's quite a, quite a lot of fun, and a real desire to communicate as if he's speaking to you. So one of his letters that he wrote uh, to Arthur Murphy, um, uh, another Irishman in London, um, uh, in the 1790s, was he was writing his reflections on the revolution in France and he said, I've, I've lately noticed that there's a real distinction between the English that is written and the English that is spoken. Which is pretty late to be <laughs> recognising this. But he, it's late for him because so much of his life was in giving speeches and writing letters that he imagined would be publicly read. And he was really, really worried about this new form of English, this uh, purely literary English that wasn't actually uh, written with a view to kind of being hotly spoken from one cere cerebral cortex into another kind of body. So again, the, these people, um, again as a school I think, were very concerned with how bodies operated and acted in the real world. And their language was around really trying to communicate their passionate ideas to people who they hoped would act on them. So that energy of a very kind of 
personal persuasive speech I think is a really good reason to call them a, a type of school in a movement, but also to, to read them again today. Um, well, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet that, that occurs to me is that one reason for reading all of these people is they all thought a bit about empire and a bit about colonies and mm -hmm. colonialism. And, and that's a contemporary concern. Hutchison, for example, um, seems to have been the first writer to defend the right of colonies to resist the mother country directly and was taken up in the American colonies uh, for this reason. So that when colonies can resist is one of the themes that's considered in Hutchison's system of moral philosophy. Um, Swift ends Gulliver's Travels spectacularly, I think, with a denunciation of European colonialism. Um, Gulliver um, says he's going to give you some reflections on the method of planting colonies and he explains that when he returns to England it's put to him that he should report all the places that he's been to and give all the details to the government so that they can be claimed as legitimate possessions of the Hanoverian crown and he decides not to do this and there is then this wonderful peroration about what colonialism really means uh, which means you know, stripping um, native cultures of their assets, imposing religious ideas on them, um, butchering the people and so on. Um, and it's made very clear when um, Gulliver says, of course, this has got nothing to do with British <laughs> colonialism. It's made very clear by Swift that what he's talking about is British colonialism. Um, and then um, Barclay... Um, in some ways also um, deals with this. I'll just read you, um, if I've got time, a quick yeah. query. Um, so uh, the queerest appears in the 1730s. Uh, it's, it's a rather strange list of, of questions um, written by Barclay. One of them is whether the bulk of our Irish na natives are not kept from thriving by that cynical contempt in dirt and beggary which they possess to a degree beyond any other people in Christendom. Well, this was a sort of rather... Um, typical colonial view of the Irish, um, uh, you know, living in filth uh, that had a very long pedigree um, and wasn't unusual. But later on, Barclay said, whether it be a vain attempt to project the flourishing of our Protestant gentry exclusive of the bulk of the natives. And that is a bit more interesting, a bit more unusual, because Barclay comes round to the view that actually settlers and natives in Ireland are a, you know, a composite social and economic unit mm -hmm. and if one of them is going to thrive, the other one must thrive too. And then finally Burke is obsessed through all his writings, including Reflections on the Revolution in France, on conquest and the legacy of conquest and that partly reflects the, the experience of his, his own family we think, certainly the families that he married into and associated with in Ireland who belong to the defeated Catholic elite rather than the, the victorious Protestants. So uh, we, we're talking about the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment is often associated with developments in scientific knowledge and scientific understanding and I think this is a, a very good reason to read Barclay in particular because his thinking about science and about mathematics is highly <coughs> original for the time. Claire ought to tell us about his mathematics. <laughs> um, but um, so he's, he's challenging the very simple, uh, what we call scientism, the simple putting science first, letting science do the work in philosophy. And he's challenging the very simple interpretations of science and mathematics. He thinks, going back to what Catherine said, you know, mathematics is only good insofar as it's useful. So pure and abstract mathematics is just a game until we can find some use for it. And he's aware of where these uses start appearing. But until that point, it's just a game. And these are, these are views about uh, science and mathematics that don't really emerge in the mainstream until the 20th century. And it's the 20th century that people suddenly rediscover Barclay's views about science and mathematics. So there's something very, very original and out of time in that that we haven't discussed yet, but 
It's well worth looking at. So yeah, I guess Barty is this figure who has this sort of tension of a real novelty and a kind of driving forward in the thought, but then when it comes to the more social and political thought, much more, and religious thought, I suppose, much more sort of conservative and tradition-seeking views. Absolutely. To follow up on the quote that Ian read, his suggestion for how you get the Irish natives um, to be more economically productive is enslavement. So he suggests that you know, beggars should be rounded up and made slaves for a, a term of years, an unspecified term of years. So there is a deeply um, problematic train in his thought. He was a slave owner himself. He, he clearly believes that there are types of people and they, need, they deserve treatment of different sorts. Right down to the details of when he's found, talking about how to run a, an educational institution, he thinks it's very important that the fellows are paid well and fed well and given lavish accommodation to establish their authority so that they're believed and trusted by the pupils. So there's this strong sense of hierarchy uh, which is often quite um, unpleasant in its application. And he became a sort of a heroic figure almost in his empirical view, or in uh, his empire views, right? In the sense that <laughs> I know Berkeley University is named after one of his. Well, certainly on. he was very influential in the development of the higher rich, what we think of as the higher rich universities in, in America. Um, he left endowments to, to Yale, which had just taken that name uh, when he was just before he got to America, and to Harvard. He corresponded with Franklin about setting up the University of Pennsylvania. They had very different ideas about the curriculum. Um, and he wrote this poem about the course of empires westward. Oh. So when the westernmost university in, in, in America, in the USA, was founded, uh, it was uh, given the name Berkeley. Uh, of course, they mispronounced it. I'm sure they see it differently. Uh, and then just, I suppose, um, on your recommendations for reading then, I mean, so what would you, if somebody wants to get a sort of, uh, a nice sort of short blast of Irish Enlightenment thought, uh, where would you tell people to start? Or what, a letter you know? to a noble lord. Okay. That's Edmund Burke, yeah. And what's that about? Um, I think it's where he really shows his, his um, the Encyclopedia Britannica for a long time described Edmund Burke's um, uh, attack on Warren Hastings as uh, evidence of his Irish birthright of sustained invective. Um, I actually think a letter to a noble lord is a wonderful example of of Burke's uh, long historical memory for true nobility and uh, aristocracy. And the Duke of Bedford, who's this young guy who's wearing his hair in the revolutionary style of, of um, um, having a, kind of a crop with a fringe um, uh, danced into the, the uh, House of Commons and, and started to attack Burke. And so Burke drew on, on all his resources and reminded this upstart gentry aristocrat exactly where he came from. Um, and I think in that kind of put down we get the joke of kind of putting down an aristocrat and who doesn't enjoy that? Um, but also we get a really good um, critique of exactly the kinds of things he's afraid of in terms of the movement of the French Revolution, which he sees is, is going to go too quickly into a state of chaos, dictatorship, terror. Um, and, and he gets to say this in, in his book, <coughs> of the Duke of Bedford. So it's a quick, short read, a letter to a noble lord. That's where it starts. Right, you mean the primary texts then? Yes. Yeah. Um, and to be completely honest, um, the things that I would recommend you to read are, are you know, practically unreadable. Um, I mean, of the two of the of the people we've discussed, um, you would love reading Swift and you would love reading Burke, um, but I. I suggest something like um, a sermon by the Reverend John Abernethy, which is called Religious Obedience Founded on Personal Persuasion, and was written in 1719. And it, it's the sermon that kicks off the, the liberalisation of Ulster Presbyterianism. It's, uh, it's got no, pretty much no literary merit <laughs> whatsoever, 
Um, but in its own way, it's a foundational text, uh, and it founds the, the movement which became known as the New Light uh, in Ulster Presbyterianism, and um, you know, is, is, is a surprise for anybody who's familiar with later generations of Ulster Presbyterians, who, not least uh, the Democratic Unionist Party <laughs> of recent times. And why is it so unreadable? It's just... Oh, well, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's... Um, it's pretty dense stuff, and you have to. I think what, one of the the things about the writers we've been discussing today is that they've been pretty much neglected by Irish historians because they don't seem to speak about Ireland directly, and that's what Irish historians want. We want people who are obsessed with Ireland, and usually people who are getting more and more Irish in each generation. And one of the tricky things with these people is you have to relearn debates that we've stopped thinking about. So the debate over whether or not you should subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith is a rather, you know, um, past uh, debate. Nevertheless, it raises principles about religious freedom that are still, you know, worth thinking about. So, Tom, I'm wondering, is it going to be a party that you're going to Well, actually, the first thing I'd say is Toland. Toland Toland doesn't get read enough, and... Mm -hmm. Um, Could you give a really quick introduction? I mean, what one of the big ideas of Toland were? So, so, so Toland's best known for this work, Christianity Not Mysterious, where he takes Locke's epistemology. He takes Locke's view of how the human mind gains knowledge through the senses and everything comes through the senses, and then uses that to critique Christian doctrine and say, well, we could never know these things. He alleges that he's producing a, a kind of a core which will be ultimately the pure form of Christianity, but it was not recognisable to most people because it avoided any sort of priesthood or religious practices. But I wouldn't actually recommend reading that. It's, it's not beautifully written. Uh, um, what I always say to read from Toland is a, a, a book he published a bit later, or parts of a book he published a bit later, called Letters to Serena. And the letters to Serena are addressed pseudonymously to um, Sophie Charlotte of Prussia, who he knew, uh, the Queen of Prussia. But uh, the, the prefatory letter there is not addressed to her, but to a fictional person who's going to help him publish these, and is a fantastic statement of the intellectual equality of women. And it's a very, very, very strong statement of how absolutely all the differences that are observed between the attainment of men and women are down to do to their different educations and how they're differently socialised. And then also in that book there's a wonderful essay on prejudice where he, he rants about the way that we built a world which starts forcing prejudices and superstitions upon our children from the moment they're born. He gets, starts with midwives and goes up through the rest of their lives. At every point you're being made to believe things for no reason at all. Um, and that's a fantastic piece of writing. Uh, very, very for Barclay, well, it's a little hard to get hold of at the moment. You need to do a bit of scouring around in the internet. But the essays he wrote for a magazine called The Guardian in 1713, when he was living in London, and this was edited by Addison, and he was part of the London literary scene at the time. They're very short, uh, about six, six or eight hundred words each, uh, and he was churning these out very fast to, to pay his rent. But they're, they're wonderful, they're very pithy, they're very clearly written, very clearly argued, and some of them uh, demonstrate this wonderful Irish imagination. He has one way, he imagines a free thinker travelling into someone's brain. And, and so, um, Quite a real early sci-fi vibe in that one. Absolutely, like yes. Transportation to the pineal gland, or That's to, right. the, to the brain, sort of yeah. part of, of somebody who's material. So, so they're lovely. Each one is just a short read, and you get a very big... Um, range of different ideas. Okay, so with that, I want to see if there's any final questions. You've talked a bit about how pragmatic uh, like Irish thought so uh, was, and so um, I got reminded of American pragmatism, which of course talked about the impact of sort of common sense in uh, America, and obviously the fact that common sense uh, from Spain uh, came to my mind. So um, did the American practice, so Dewey, Peirce, William James, what you said reminded me of William James mm -hmm. quite strongly. Did they mention Irish uh, Enlightenment at all? Did they, were they aware of these sort of groups? 
Well, Hutcherson was on the curriculum um, of 18th century high school virtually, and certainly in, in, in universities. Um, uh, but he's called as, you know, the father of the Scottish Enlightenment. So a lot of the Scots-Irish who, who emigrated to the States would have looked to Hutchison, who's a, a huge figure um, in American colonial and revolutionary thinking. And, and certainly I think his pragmatism, Barclay's pragmatism, and Burke, who they absolutely adore, all of the, all of the men who we know as the American pragmatists, would have studied these people in secondary school and also university. So I like to think that there's a particular um, um, impact there. I'd even go so far as one of kind of my little musings at the moment is, is just wondering, one of the things I, I want to kind of chase down and follow up if I can is that uh, American phrase, a pluribus unum, from many we are one, which is the, the definition of beauty in Hutchison. Uh, we see beauty when we uh, finally can kind of pull together a load of different diverse elements and see one organic beautiful whole. It's the kind of coming together of diversity into one organic unit makes something beautiful. Uh, and I like to think that, that maybe that phrase of Akari Basunam would have come from uh, the, that very influential idea of Hutchison. Um, so yeah, I think that's, again, to talk about some of my family traits that I think we might be able to explore and, and, and see if, if they fit for the idea of an Irish Enlightenment. The impact of these thinkers on America, I think, is, is a, a very strong, if you like, backward glance uh, look at these people that does make them into a more coherent school than we might think of at this moment of time. Thanks for the question. Uh, there's not a lot to add to that. Um, it's, it's definitely the case that most of these Irish thinkers are being read in America. Um, <coughs> In, in the 19th century with, as pragmatism is developing. And you can see distinct echoes and occasional references. Peirce writes about Barclay. So, um, in the West Wing, they quote Burke a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know that TV show? Yeah, they're um, constantly quoting. But then there are also people who just dropped out of print. So several of the people we've mentioned today not been in print for centuries. That, that's another problem that I was just thinking as a final note, I know Molyneux was uh, a person who was in the hands of some American revolutionaries, right? At the oh yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Molyneux was picked up in the 1760s um, in the American colonies because of his um, insistence, uh, which became an American slogan, um, that uh, to be free meant to take part in your own government, but to be subject to laws to which you had not consented was to be a slave. I was also just thinking about a pluribus unum. That does answer the earlier question about Irish unity, doesn't it? Because that was all. Also, what John Hume uh, used to bang on about all the time, and what the what the United States of America has to teach Ireland mm -hmm. is a pluribus unum. Mm -hmm. So there you are. Maybe it does all go back to Francis Hutchinson, the Irish Enlightenment. Okay. Well, on that note of unity, maybe we'll, we'll finish. So just to thank our speakers very much.